Our speakers tonight are Andy, Dr. Andy Bertolatis, the, who is the Executive Director, he'll connect, correct my pronunciation of his name, the Executive Director, Human Subjects Office, and Associate Professor, Internal Medicine, University of Iowa. His interests are in the area of clinical trials, clinical investigations in the area of renal transplantation, and the protection of human subjects in research. He also has a major commitment to the area of protection of human subjects in research. Since 2000, he has been the co-chair of the University of Iowa Biomedical Institutional Review Board. He is also a member of the Council on Accreditation of the Association for Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs and is a frequent accreditation site visitor for this voluntary accreditation program. Our second speaker is Professor Martine Dunwald, Doctor of Pharmacy and a Research Assistant Professor, Pediatrics, Neonatology, as well as an Adjunct Assistant Professor, Genetics and Molecular Biology and Cellular Biology, University of Iowa. Her research interests involve skin, epidermal development and regeneration, and oral facial clefts. We'll take questions after the presentation. Andy? Thank you. Let me, uh, let's see. Do I need to do anything to get back to the... Uh, you want zombies? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Let me... I just need to get back to the main screen to... The zombies have taken over the screen. Yeah. This, is this yours? Yep, that's me. I just need to maximize it. Yeah, if you want to hit five. And is it too bright Four. in here? Can everyone see? No. Yeah. Mm. Well, good evening to all of you. It's really gratifying to see this turnout, see the number of people who are interested in this subject. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on this evening is talking about the general area of research on human subjects, vulnerable and not so vulnerable, and learning from the past, perhaps so that we don't repeat it, or at least not all of it. So we've already heard a little bit about Henrietta Lacks. Uh, the, the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, has been chosen as a focus of this year's uh, Iowa City Book Festival, and I'd like to applaud that choice. This is really a very fascinating book that deals with the life story of Henrietta Lacks and the cell line that was derived from her tumor, but it's also a really good introduction to the whole story of the evolution of our thoughts about the ethics and oversight of research involving human subjects over the last, oh, I would say 70 years or so. Uh, Henrietta was a woman who died of an unusually aggressive cervical cancer at a very young age. She was treated at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. So I have a little bit of a very indirect connection with this story in that that's where I went to medical school. And at the time I was there, first of all, I'd like to emphasize I didn't have any role in her care because she died in 1951. That was the year I was born. So. <laughs> The story was, that part of the story was over before uh, I came along. But we heard about it, these cell lines. We heard about HeLa cells and the creation of this line when I was in medical school. I, I think actually at that time with a fair amount of, of pride or um, acknowledgement of a, of a great accomplishment, uh, although my wife, who was also a student there at the same time, recalls that there was already some growing unease about some aspects of her story and the story of the HeLa cells. A, a Dr. George Guy, who was a, a gynecologic doctor and scientist, <laughs> used some cells from her tumor to create a, a so-called immortal cell line. That is, when cells from this tumor were put into tissue culture medium, they would grow and divide and keep going indefinitely, and their descendants are still going today, as far as I know. I think it tells you something about the unique nature of her cell line is that he and many others have been trying to do this kind of thing for years. And the reason I think it worked with her cells is this was just an incredibly uh, unusual and very invasive uh, tumor cell line that was, you know, you probably could have tossed it in the kitchen sink and it might have grown. Uh, now, 
if there's any ethical issue here, it's that all of this took place, I think, without telling her that it was going to be done or telling her family that it was going to be done. And it just sort of started and was done. And I think by the standards of, of the time, that was thought to be OK. I'm going to talk more broadly about the evolution of some of the regulations and ethical standards that we have today about research on human subjects, human persons, and the oversight of that research. And for better or for worse, over the years I've observed and also, I guess now, practiced that when people speak about this topic, they usually give a history of misadventures and bad examples. And that's what we're going to do uh, this evening, at least for a few minutes. So many people start here with this pretty egregious example of what is not a good way to experiment on human beings. The, the Nazi doctors using concentration camp inmates during World War II to pursue a variety of pretty horrific experiments. What's being shown here in this picture is uh, taking a person and immersing him in ice water uh, with various kinds of protective or maybe not so protective gear on to see how much it might protect them from uh, hypothermia. And of course, the goal was to try and protect uh, downed flyers or maybe uh, mariners, but uh, it was being tested out on uh, concentration camp inmates. And by, by far, this is, a, I, I would say, a relatively mild example of some of the things they, they did, uh, which included throwing people out of airplanes and infecting them with all kinds of terrible diseases and, and things like that. So ultimately, along with all the other atrocities committed in the concentration camps and in other places, the, this resulted in a, re, a review of these events in the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II. And I think I read in the caption of this picture that this over here is supposed to be Hermann Goering. Um, but you probably have all heard of the Nuremberg trials. You know about the general uh, findings of the Nazi war criminals. Many of them were actually put to death as the result of the findings of the Nuremberg trials. But from the research standpoint, one of the things that came out of this review, which included a review of what the doctors had done, was something called the Nuremberg Code. And this is one of the first times that people tried to put together a set of principles about how it might be OK to do research on human participants. And here's, this is not an exclusive or exhaustive list, but this is some of the concepts that they brought forth. So for example, they said that there should be voluntary consent and voluntary participation of the human subject that you should try as much as possible, consistent with the goals of your research, to avoid physical and or mental suffering, that the risks that you subject these people to should be somehow proportionate to the benefit that might accrue to them, or at least to society, if not to them. And no experiment should be deliberately undertaken, designed to knowingly injure someone, as many of these concentration camp experiments were, and also that the experiments should be carried out by qualified persons who were trained to appropriately conduct such experiments. Now, we read down this list today, I guess some of us anyway, and say, well, well, duh, isn't this all obvious? Well, I don't think it was obvious back in the late 1940s and early 1950s. I think a lot of people had not really thought about this and might necess not necessarily have subscribed to all of the elements in this code. So we move forward a little bit away from Nazi Germany and into our own country and talk about another not so great example of research on humans, which has to do with the United States Public Health Service syphilis study carried out in and around Tuskegee, Alabama. So what happened? This was a study that was conducted over a very long fairly long period of time, from 1932 up to 1972, and it involved about 600 participants, most of whom were poor sharecroppers, most of whom were black, in rural Alabama. 
And it started out in 1932 as a study of the natural history of untreated syphilis, which in 1932 was probably reasonably ethical and appropriate because there actually wasn't any available or accepted effective treatment for this sexually transmitted disease. So when we say studying the natural history, that means you just watch what happens to people who acquire a certain disease and you uh, don't have any treatment of them. And you know, by today's standards, the recruitment of these subjects was pretty suboptimal. It was presented to them more as a way of getting medical care, which they didn't have much of, uh, rather than being an experiment or a research study. So at the start, maybe it wasn't all that bad, but here's the rest of the story. So as time went on over that long period of time, uh, going into the 1940s and especially the early 1950s, treatments for syphilis did become available, specifically the antibiotic penicillin, which became more available during World War II and even more widely available after. So when that happened, no one told these participants in this project that there was any possibility of treatment. No one stopped the whole study at that point, and no one offered the treatment, or at least the possibility of treatment, to any of the subjects. Now, to be honest, many of them had advanced stages of the disease, and they may or may not have been helped, but one could have, I think, at least tried. Another example of some of these misadventures in human subject research comes out of something called the Willowbrook Hepatitis Study. This is a picture I came up with of the, the Willowbrook Hospital. This is on Staten Island, which is a part of New York City that uh, is just across from, really just five or 10 miles from a place in New Jersey where I grew up. Uh, <clears throat> and this was a hospital mostly for developmentally disabled people. I think they were mostly children and young adults. A large percentage, I, I guess I've always heard, uh, had Down syndrome and similar conditions. Um, there was a fair amount of demand for getting such children into this institution to have them taken care of. So there was a bit of a disincentive for the parents to complain about what happened uh, when they were there. So. Some of the uh, physician scientists who were involved with the treatment of these uh, children at this hospital uh, deliberately infected them with hepatitis viruses, the, the hepatitis A and hepatitis B, the so-called uh, infectious hepatitis and serum hepatitis. And part of the rationale for doing this was that, well, these <clears throat> these uh, people had a very high rate of acquiring these infections anyway because of poor hygienic conditions. The, uh, particularly the infectious hepatitis is transmitted by basically a stool to oral kind of route, which is sort of unpleasant to talk about, but in fact these were uh, situations where, or, where hygiene was not great and they were often coming down with this, these infections anyway, but whether that is justification for deliberately infecting them by having them drink solutions of the virus is pretty debatable, I think. And the reason for doing this was simply to give them an exposure to the virus at a known point in time so that you could look at what happened to them after that point and get a very solid timeline of the events of the infection, what laboratory tests became abnormal at what point, what symptoms developed, and uh, that kind of thing. And then also one of the things that did come out of some of this work was a demonstration that there was a, at least for the infectious hepatitis, a uh, somewhat, infect, uh, somewhat effective method of treatment with, with what they called at that time uh, gamma globulin, which is just pooled antibodies from uh, populations of healthy, normal people to help, I guess, fight off the virus. And finally, another example in this uh, history would be the, uh, something that's usually referred to as the Guatemala Sexually Transmitted or Disease or STD study, which was started in the late 1940s and uh, carried on into the 50s. And 
So in this study, people were deliberately infected with either syphilis or gonorrhea. And there's all kinds of issues with this study. Some of these people were prisoners. Uh, some of them were infected by being offered sex with infected, known infected prostitutes. And some were given direct injections of the infectious agents. And sometimes they were treated after they were infected, but probably not adequately and maybe not always. And th these studies were actually funded by the US government. Now, this did not actually come to light until pretty recently because the person who was overseeing this as the main investigator, they never really, they never published any of this. It seems like they maybe knew that this wasn't going to be looked on too favorably. So most of these results were kind of stacked away in some boxes at this person's institution and kind of brought to light really by the work of an academic uh, historian who kind of discovered this whole story and made it more public just within, I guess, about the last five, six years or so. So after the occurrence of these kinds of episodes or incidents and some others that I'm not going to talk about today, there became a growing recognition in the United States that there was a need to start setting up some ethical standards and maybe some regulations about doing research on human beings. And one of the landmarks along the way in this process was the, the development, the, the creation of something called the Belmont Report that was partially put out in 1978 and then more uh, finally uh, promulgated in 1979. And this was not named after the racetrack that we hear about every spring in New York. It was uh, named after a conference center in uh, northeastern Maryland that uh, was the, the site of having this, this conference that developed these standards. And they really elaborated three principles that they thought were key in determining whether or not you could do ethical research on humans. The first pr uh, principle was justice, which mainly meant trying to be uh, equitably distributing both the burdens and the benefits of the research across different groups of our population, and maybe today we think even more broadly different across more populations around the world. But you don't expect poor black people or prisoners to take on all the risk and then have the benefit be available to everybody else. The second concept was that of beneficence or, or basically doing good. And the idea is that that, that is followed or that is uh, recognized by trying to maximize the benefit that you get from a certain research project while minimizing the risk. Minimizing the risk can be, there can be many aspects to that. One can be um, designing experiments so that maybe they use information that comes out of things that people need for their own health care anyway. So that's, that's one possibility. Uh, another would be trying to only use the smallest number of people in your research study that will give you an answer to your question. And there's a whole lot of ways that you can actually do that. And then finally, uh, respect for persons was the third Belmont Report principle. And uh, really the key way that this is put into practice is by recognizing people's autonomy, which means informing them as best you can about your research, about what you're trying to do, about the risks and the possible benefits, and letting them decide first if they want to be part of the research, and secondly, letting them uh, consistently, uh, consistently continue to decide if they want to stay in the research along the way and allowing them to get out if they're just not happy at some point. And one of the uh, other parts of autonomy is trying to offer special protection for people who have diminished autonomy compared to the general population. And this you know, could include a large number of different classes of people, but in general has looked mostly at the groups of people, which would be children, prisoners, and pregnant women. Now, I've always been a little troubled myself by saying that pregnant women have diminished autonomy. And um, because I don't think that they, per se, that they really do. But really, if you look at the focus of these regulations, it's more on the fetus as a entity with diminished 
autonomy than it is on the mother or the pregnant woman. So a couple years more years went by, and then in 1981, there finally came on the scene in the United States Federal Register uh, a set of regulations that most of us by shorthand now refer to as the common rule. And the reason it's called the common rule is that a, a group of 18 uh, US government agencies that sponsor research in humans all agreed that these rules uh, would be appropriate for the research, for governing the research that their agencies support. And I've been told that this is pretty much an unprecedented uh, incidence of agreement amongst these agencies, which in view of what's happened in the last few days, I could easily believe. Um, so this, the rule, it's important to understand what this rule actually does and what, to what it applies. It applies to all research involving humans if there is support from a federal government agency that is one of these common rule agencies. And, and this covers most of the federal support. It, it covers the uh, Department of Health and Human Services and the, the National Institutes of Health is part of that, so that's probably the biggie. Uh, but it covers the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, which actually surpri surprisingly supports a, a lot of research in medical conditions, and all, a bunch of other agencies as well. But it does not apply to research that is not sponsored by federal entities. And to this day, we really don't have any federal rules about human subjects research that apply across the board. The late Senator Ted Kennedy worked very hard towards the creation of such rules, but basically it never went anywhere. And we, we, we still don't have any, any such thing. So these rules don't cover all human research. Uh, I, now, I forgot to mention on the previous slide, the FDA, the, Fed, the, Food and Drug, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, has a similar set of rules to the common rule that are almost identical uh, with a very few minor exceptions. So if, even if you don't have federal resport, support for your research, if your research comes under the oversight and regulations of the FDA, uh, you do have to live with similar rules. And basically that means research that involves drugs, especially investigational drugs that are not yet widely, that are not yet approved to be marketed and sold, and devices of, of the same sort, stints and pacemakers and things like that. Now, there are a few states that have specific re regulations about research in humans, not many, and not Iowa. There's no special research regulations here in Iowa. We make some decisions about how to do certain things in research by uh, sort of by inference or extrapolation from our rules about clinical medicine, but that's really a different animal. So what are some of the things that these regulations say? What do they require? Well, for one thing, all research on humans uh, have to be, has to be reviewed by something called an Institutional Review Board, or an IRB, before beginning. That's the one big thing. The other big thing is that participants have to give their consent for participation according to certain expectations about how that's going to be done and how it's going to be documented in some cases. What do the regulations say about these boards called IRBs. Well, they have to have at least five members. Most of them, like ours, have a lot more than that, just so we can have more ability, you know, more workload, more, we don't have to load up one person with reviewing too much stuff. So we tend to have more like 15, 14 or 15 members. Uh, at least one person on the board, and one person ha at every meeting has to be someone that we can call a non scientist, a person whose interests are not primarily in a scientific field, and there's never been an exact definition, really, of what that means, so we're somewhat left to decide that on our own. Uh, there also has to be at least one person on the IRB who's not affiliated with the institution, so in our case, that means not affiliated with the University of Iowa, and if you've lived here for a while, you know it's not that easy to find people who, and that means also their family members, their immediate family members can't be affiliated with the University of Iowa, which 
here in Iowa City can be a bit of a problem. We're supposed to make efforts to balance the composition of the board with respect to gender and ethnicity, also things that can sometimes be challenging here in Iowa City. And if, on, if as we occasionally do, we're talking about studies that want to involve prisoners, uh, we have to have somebody that we can designate as a prisoner representative. And this just means somebody who is knowledgeable about prison. It doesn't mean they have to be a prisoner or ex-prisoner, although they could be. Um, but they have to be knowledgeable about prison life, prison regulations, um, prison conditions, and that kind of thing. And we've been lucky to have very good representation in that, in that regard. Now, I mentioned at the start that I was going to talk a little bit about vulnerable populations. Um, the common rule actually itself sort of officially defines really three categories. But let me start by saying that I've heard many speakers at meetings very uh, per, uh, persuasively argue, which I, and I think they're right, that really all of us can at times be vulnerable when we are approached about being in a research study. Uh, I don't care if you're a rich white male, which I guess I sort of am, if somebody's just come in, if, somebody, if a doctor's just told you yesterday or, or this morning that your kid's got leukemia and now somebody wants to talk to you about a research study, you're vulnerable, you're very vulnerable, but, um, and you, you're gonna be struggling to understand what, especially if you're not a physician, and even if you are, I think, you know, understanding what they wanna do, what it means, and what you should, what you should decide. So vulnerability is a spectrum and anybody can be made uh, vulnerable at times. But under the rules, we specifically have these three categories that have been picked out and given actually special protections under the rules. Children would be number one. Children, every time the IRB reviews a study that involves children, we have to make a determination about the level of risk involved from minimal up to more than minimal without any possibility of benefit to the children. And sometimes under some of these, after some of these decisions, we are required to actually have both parents, if there are two parents, uh, consent to the research. And in most cases, depending on the age of the children and the nature of the conditions being studied, uh, the children, even though they don't give effective consent to be in the research, they have to assent. They are often given a verbal or simplified written presentation of the research, and under many scenarios, they, uh, if, they if the child does not want to percent, uh, participate in the activity, they, they don't have to. Now, obviously, if the child is below a certain age, this isn't really, when people do research on neonates in the nursery, you know, they, nobody's talking about assent of those kids and under some circumstances if we're talking about this usually comes up in oncology or cancer research if we're talking about a potentially effective treatment for the cancer that is <clears throat> only available in the context of research then uh, assent might be be waived for those kids now as i mentioned there's a special set of regulation about about pregnant women but if you read down the the criteria that have to be looked at and uh, assessed and determined by the IRB for pregnant women is mostly about, it's mostly about the risk to the fetus. And honestly, in my opinion, these regulations mostly reflect concern about women not being induced in some way to have abortions to provide fetal tissue for research. Uh, and it's also somewhat about involving, under certain circumstances, the, the father of the fetus in decisions about the research. And finally, the third uh, group that's got some special regulations about uh, involvement in research would be prisoners. And the main concerns are coercion of the prisoners, um, making them feel that they, they have to be involved in a research project if they want to get fair or even, you know, just basic levels of fair treatment in, in prison. Um, in this day and age, these regulations actually specifically prohibit promising any kind of reduction in sentence or better conditions in prison 
uh, you're, you are actually not allowed to make those kinds of promises or uh, changes in somebody's circumstances as a, as a result of them agreeing to be in research. And another thing that comes up quite a bit that we have to worry about is disclosure of illegal activities. Now, that's always an issue in any kind of research. You know, lots of people like to do research here on the University of Iowa campus and go out and ask our students and others about their use of alcohol and drugs and other stuff like that, and we're always worried about how confidential those results will be and things like that. But particularly for people in prison, those are big issues. I mean, you can get your sentence extended, you can get in a, and you can also get in trouble for a lot of things that aren't illegal uh, out in the general community. For example, I think in some of our prisons now, it might even be illegal to have cigarettes uh, because they're non-smoking. I know it's illegal in most of them to gamble, although apparently there's a bit of it, a good bit of it that goes on. So, you know, there, it, there's a, it's a different set of risks when somebody is in prison as far as getting information from them about some of these activities. Another group of people that are, get involved in research, now this is not, this doesn't come out of the federal regulations because people with cognitive impairment, there's no special rules about them in the law, in the regulations. But most places, including our own, have realized that this is a group of people where we need to have some extra thought and extra concern. Uh, because these are people, this is another group of people with diminished autonomy. If they have a bad enough cognitive impairment from some form of dementia, like Alzheimer's or other things, they're realistically, they're, they're not going to be able to make, a, they're not going to be able to understand very well, or maybe at all, what you want to do and why you want to do it, and really cannot give something that we would think of as realistic or meaningful informed consent. So their consent usually comes from a legally authorized representative, and we have there's a specific uh, set of people in a certain order who, who can fill, fulfill that role in the state of Iowa. And usually we're hoping that research done in people like this is going to either be a very minimal risk or have some chance of helping them, although there, there can be at least a few exceptions. I, well, we have to admit that if we want to get anywhere with this treating this, dealing with this devastating problem of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, we need research and we need good quality research, but we gotta be careful about, about how we do it. So I started a little bit with the Henrietta Lacks case and didn't really dwell much on, on her case as a, as a reason for the evolution of our current regulations. The reason is I don't think most people really view her case as playing that much of a role in the current oversight system and regulations that we have. So how would we look at her case today? Well, I would say pr probably not as bad as some of the other examples I re revealed early on, primarily because she was, there's no reason to think that the creation of the HeLa cell line um, harmed her or put her at increased risk. But I do think that today we probably would require that she be asked about the permission to create the cell line that is now known as the HeLa cell line. We, we certainly allow some kinds of research to be done on tissues that have come from patients in the course of their clinical care uh, without necessarily getting their permission. But typically we're talking about pathology samples that have come from a biopsy of a tumor or some other tissue, been sent to the lab, have been been put into paraffin wax to make little slices or sections of them, and then those blocks of paraffin have been put off to storage. And if somebody says, you know, I want 10 slides from tissue with prostate cancer or something like that, but I don't want any other information about those people at all, um, they'd probably be given those tissues to go do some kind of research on. But if somebody wanted to take the cells, turn them into a culture line, and keep them going for years, we'd probably expect that that person be asked for their permission. And we actually know from some work done in the last few years of surveying populations around Iowa that most people are, are not against this kind of thing being done, but they do like to be, be told about it and, and informed. So that's the end of my remarks. I think we're waiting to the end for questions. Is that right? I'm pretty sure. Yep, okay. Let me. Let's see, you 
numbers, I think, is this one? Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead and... Ooh, wide spot. Um, so this was a wonderful uh, introduction to all of the regulation. And, and when I've been asked to um, uh, contribute to the evening, um, I've been asked to do it in the context of people probably don't know what cells are. People probably don't know what we do with them. Um, would you be interested in talking about uh, what tissue culture is or what cell culture is? And I was thrilled with the idea of being able to do this because I think that as scientists, we do a terrible job at explaining what we do. We're fascinating what we do. We always get these little cartoons of you know, the little scientists behind their microscope, and they do all these little things that are very obscure. And we don't really do a good job at explaining to people like you why it matters, what we can get out of it, what you guys can benefit of eventually our research, because eventually we do get some tax money uh, to do some of this research, and maybe you have a right to ask what is done with it. So I thought I'd kind of take you through the journey of a HeLa cell or what is actually tissue culture. And I'm gonna use interchangeably tissue and cell culture and you'll see why. Um, giving you a few examples, giving you an uh, example of things that I care about and that I like to do. Um, I also bought a microscope because I think that, I mean, if we like cells or if I do like cells and my favorite cells are skin cells, is because I love to look at them and yet, they may all be different, but they may also be all the same. Um, I did brought HeLa cells. So for those who've never seen any HeLa cells, you can look at them. Um, and I also brought you some little dishes that hopefully you guys can get a gist of what are we talking about when we talk about HeLa cells. So, so the outline of the talk is, I'm gonna try to briefly describe what is a cell. Um, I'll give you a brief history of cell or tissue culture. Um, what do we do with cells? So we use them for research, and what kind of research can we do? And this could be you know, the topic of hours and hours, and so I'll just pick a couple of examples. Um, what can we do with cells can, clinically? Because there's actually, cells are used to treat people, believe it or not. And I think that it has gone beyond just using them in the laboratory or using them um, in the pharmaceutical company. But you, know, you personally can actually benefit of having a cell therapy. And then these little microscopic observations that I think are, I don't know, it's hands-on. And I think that being able to see something with your own eyes will represent, would represent a lot to me. I'll try to keep it fairly short because the other thing is I have no idea what your background is. And so I really rather just give you an overview and you asking me questions of things that you don't understand, you don't know, than me kind of talking for hours about <coughs> something that actually you guys all know or you actually don't care about. So deep into the human body. So if we look at it, we look at each other. Leonardo da Vinci looked at you know, the human body and this is kind of what we see. now. We are made of multiple different things. And the first level, by kind of going down into, it would be like a version of Google Map, but using the human body as well, what you see is organs. So there are multiple ones, and Leonardo da Vinci saw some of them, and you can look at you know, the kidney, and the heart, and vessels, and bones. And there are some that we see all the time, okay? So we see the hair, we see our eyes, we see you know, our skin, um, we feel our heart, but there are others that we don't see very much, but we know they are there. So we have blood, the blood can come out, but the blood has a good function that sometimes we know and sometimes we don't know. So if we take each of these little organs and we kind of zoom in again, we end up with tissues. So what we scientists define as tissue would be and I'm gonna use skin as, a, as an example because I worked on it, but also because it's an easy one to understand because we can all look at it. And so I can use those examples. So the tissue would be um, within the organ skin, there's multiple tissues. So there's multiple compartments. So 
So we may have the compartment that we all see on the outside is called the epidermis. And this is what sloughs off all the time. You get on the sun and you get, you know, a little bit too wet and eventually in a few days it peels off. Well, it's the epidermis that peels off. Now, the beauty of the body is that it comes back all the time. And I'm not going to talk about it this too much, but it's because you have cells that keep regenerating your <coughs> epidermis. Um, the dust in your house, it's probably 90% of cells, dead cells, dead skin cells. That's what it is, OK? Um, now, underneath it, you have another compartment, and that's called the dermis. And there are multiple compartments within the same organ. So this is true for the liver, will be true for the heart, will be true for all of those. So we can look at this, and these are the tissues. And then all the tissues, and in this example, all of the little, I guess they are pink. Uh, if you would zoom in on these little pink dots, what you would see is this single structure that is the cell. Okay, so everybody talk about cell, cell culture, HeLa cell. So this is coming from this little book. And this is a wonderful little kid book. And there's a few of those in the series. And really, it's enjoy yourselves. And it's really just fun facts, um, fun little things about the cells. But whether you are a kid or you are just a kid in your, in your heart, I think you should kind of look at it. It's really fun. So, um, so the cell, what is the cell? So it's this structure. It's kind of like. You build a house and you need, you know, the unit to build it. It's going to be maybe your, I don't know, your, your concrete block. Well, you need multiple concrete blocks to build a house. Well, the body uses multiple cells to build itself. And we can go deeper and we'll go one more step. But this is really what we're talking about. So what the cell has is... Um, it has an outside wall. It's called a membrane. It's right here. And uh, I forgot to, I was going to give you the kids definition of the membrane, which I think is very fun. This membrane engloses jelly-like cytoplasm. Oh, the membrane is a bit like a soap bubble. So I thought that was a good representation because it's made of all kinds of things that reminds of a soap bubble. Um, and then inside, there's all kind of these little organelles, as we call them. And it's full of stuff um, that helps the cell survive. Uh, they call them blobby bits and more blobby bits and tubes and all kinds of other things. And then inside, in, and typically, we just always like to put it in the middle, but it's not always in the middle, is what we call the nucleus. And so this is really kind of the essence of the cell. And what you have inside this nucleus is what people call the DNA. So we all heard about DNA. And this is where all the genetic information is. And this is what makes us who we are and why we're different from the neighbor. But we're full of DNA. And if we look at really at the unit level, these two individuals would be the same, almost, not quite. And so we, I don't want to go into all of those details, but really, um, this is kind of the DNA is all of these letters, all of these little four colors here are for uh, the essence of with the DNA. The DNA is going to make protein. The protein is going to make a cell. And then the cell is going to make the tissue. The tissue is going to make the organ. The organ is going to make the body. So you can go it this way, or you can go it this way. Um, and so the cell is one of these unique um, piece. So in order for us to understand how we function, which has been always kind of the question that scientists ask themselves, you need to simplify. It's too complicated. How are we going to study ourselves as a whole? So we all do that. We, we break it down, and we kind of get it to a unit that we can understand. Or we bring it to a system where we just have one variable that we can then ask ourselves, well, you know, the light is not working. Well, why is the light not working? Well, there's so many different components that hopefully if we break it just to one thing, then we can figure out, well, is the bulb the issue or not? Or is the wire the issue or not? So scientists have done the same thing. So being able to get these single units and be able to study them would help them uh, understand how the body functions. 
So back in 1885, um, what they first started was to take embryonic ch ch chicken tissue and put it in a warm solution and see if they could actually just maintain it and keep it alive. Um, and they were <coughs> successful. And then uh, at the turn of the um, 20th century, Harrison was able to grow frog nerves. So again, using animals and using very rudimentary uh, laboratory technique, they were all just trying to maintain pieces of animals alive and see if um, they could then study them. And then Carol will have made kind of a, a next step because he was able to maintain pieces of chicken hearts uh, contracting in a, in, in a little petri dish. Um, I guess I should just, I talk about petri dish, but at the time they were not as sophisticated, but this is what I call a petri dish for those who don't really know. And I'll pass those around a um, bit. Or they could be bigger, or they can look in a different way of today, probably not in 1900. But, um, so this was a big step. And so using animal tissue, then people were able to extract cells from different compartments. And the most common one is what we call the fibroblast. So your dermis, you remember what is right under the epidermis, is basically kind of a, a jello with cells in them. And the name of these cells are fibroblasts. So, um, but they were doing this with animal tissue. And then they were able to establish um, fibroblast cell line. And I'll come back to the terminology about cell line. And another point that uh, I'll come back to is in 1949, people were able to grow viruses in cell culture. And I, my next slide will um, illustrate why this was actually really important. So we already talked about it. So in 1952, um, that was um, the first human cell line that was established. And I'll tell you a little bit, I mean, you heard about it, and um, maybe something that you don't know about these HeLa cells. And these were coming from a tumor. So the tumor is basically a piece of the body where things go wrong. So cells, instead of being proliferating, dividing, and then stopping, and then doing it when it's needed, they just continue doing it and continue doing it. So you have these tumors and these expansion, and this is why these cells actually have been able to be kept for so long because they kept doing it now outside the body. Now all of these tissue culture were done, the, one of the challenge was, well, how, how are you maintain the cells? We need food to live. That means the cells need food to live too. So optimizing the food that was given to the cells in order for us scientists to maintain them in culture was again a major step. And one of them was done by this uh, Mr. Eagle. And we still use his name in the lab um, when we buy medium to grow cells. We call that Eagle's medium. Um, and they find the first medium. And then in 1962, that's gonna be my last kind of historical perspective, um, Dr. Hayflick, uh, again, did um, the first human cell line. So you're gonna say, well, in 52, they did the first human cell line. So why are you telling us that in 62, they did again the first human cell line? Well, the big difference is the HeLa cells are coming from abnormal tissue. It's coming from a tumor, it's not normal. So we are taking advantage of it, but it wasn't normal tissue. So if you really wanna understand how the normal body works, it may not be the best model. So Dr. Hayflake was actually the first who were able to grow cells, but coming from, and I guess I'll say it, and it is an ethical debate that some people are bothered by. He was actually uh, interested in getting cells from fetus. And so he collaborated with people in Sweden and uh, was able to actually get a fetal lung tissue and grow cells so normal um, from feel along. And these cells are still available today the same way that the EVL cells are. I don't have them though, here. So what is ba uh, bas the, the basic of the tissue culture? So what do we do, what do I do every day when, when we grow cells? So 
the principle is fairly simple. Um, we take the organ, so whichever organ we're interested in, um, and then we break it down into tissues. So we have the capability with enzymes and other uh, reagents in the laboratory to separate, again, for instance, the epidermis from the dermis or in the heart separate the outside from the inside. And then by putting these different tissues in enzyme, then we can actually break down the, the, the cells usually attached to each other by little you know, proteins, and we can break those. And so you end up with having single cells into, into a tube. And if you have single cells into a tube, then you can just you know, put them in a liquid, and you put them at the bottom of a culture dish, and you can grow them if you have appropriate food, and that's what we do. So um, this is an example of what cells look like. This is actually pretty close as what you can look at uh, under the microscope. Um, and then we can characterize them. We can look at the shape. We can look at all kinds of things. Now, if a dish like this is full, then the cells are crowded. So they need more food, and they need more food. And at some point, eventually, they are gonna, they're not going to survive. It's going to be too many in one class. So what do we do? Well, we have ways to actually take them off of the bottom of the flask, and we count them. And we decide, well, we're just going to put some in a new flask that didn't have any cells. And we're only going to put a few of them. And so we can expand those culture for a long time. So this is kind of what the procedure is. So here again with an enzyme, we go back to a single cell suspension. We plate them again. And we do that over and over and over and over again. So the beauty of it is that a cell will divide and will divide. And then you just get more and more. And you just have more material to work with. So I needed to put one slide um, that was a little bit technical, but it matters in the context of what we call cell line versus primary cells and then the use in the clinic. And so bear with me just for a second. If I take a piece of skin from any of you today and I'll try to extract your cells, these cells have never seen a Petri dish ever. So what will happen is if I get 100 cells when I put them in a plastic dish, after a day, 90 of them will be dead, just because they don't care for plastic, and they don't like it, OK? But the 10 of them that eventually did attach and like it, those are the ones that somehow, for whatever reason, got selected. And those are the ones that are going to divide. And those are the ones that then eventually will keep multiplying um, over time. So here I just put 10 days. Now, once this is full, so when my 10 cell eventually fill my dish, I can take, it off, I take, take those cells off, and then I can, what we say, replate, so take a subset of them and put them back in that dish. Now, the one I'm going to put in the dish, they have already know what a dish is. They like it. They're happy. <laughs> so what happened is that we don't lose that many, barely, here. And then the one that, you know, then you don't lose them, and then these cells keep dividing and dividing. And so the second culture is usually much more productive than the first one. So this is just an illustration. One cell will give you two, and then this cell will give you two. And so you can do this. So can you do this forever? Not with the cells of your skin. So Dr. Heflick, that I was talking about earlier, said you can only do that when the cell double, each cell will double 50 times. And then eventually, they kind of die in culture, just because they're not made to divide forever. So we call those primary cells. And these cells are used, and I'll give you a couple of examples. But you can see how it's labor intensive for the scientists, because you have to do that over and over again with every time a new piece of tissue. But it has some value. So the other case would be to take cells that you don't lose that many at the beginning for other reasons. So whether these might be from a cancer, because they for, are capable of dividing more often, or that you change something in their DNA that makes them more likely to divide. 
And so what you do is right away you kind of get, oops, right away you kind of get these cells to divide very quickly. And then when you subculture them, you can see they can just go crazy. And you can get millions of cells that you eventually probably toss. And so these are the kind of cells that they keep dividing and dividing. They do it quick and they do it efficiently. And there is no limit. And so these are the cells that we call the model. And so people have traditionally called a cell line um, these immortal cells. So HeLa would be a cell line. So it's the WI38 are a cell line. And there's hundreds of them. And all of these cells are abnormal. So they have something that make them keep dividing more easily. And they become then a great tool for scientists to use them in the laboratory just because you can do that very easily and they're not going to die. So we use them in science and in research for you know, the primary cells that I was telling you. So the one, if I take a piece of your skin or I take a piece of your liver, um, it's a simple unit of, of complex biology. It's a good model because I really take it from a normal piece of tissue from an individual. Hopefully it hasn't been modified although I may have selected the one that like to grow in plastic. And for us, they are key to understand how w the body works or how the genetic information translates into biological function. But they'll die eventually. So anytime we divide them, we call that passage. If I take one of your skin cell, I can probably do that six times, 10 times. Um, if I would take HeLa cells, I can do this twice a week and I can do it forever. People have done that for 60 years. Um, so the primary cells, they're expensive and they're labor intensive. So the immortal cells, um, it's just a model. The genome is completely altered. So um, it can be a tool, but we have to know it's a tool. They are cost effective and they are easy to use. So just one slide on the HeLa cells. Um, so as you know, as it's been said, so the, um, these cells were coming from um, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, I have to say that uh, it's very unusual, um, and obviously that has been the debate and the ethical issue for people to reveal the names of the donors unless, unless there is some consent. Um, but even if there is consent, revealing the name of an individual is something that is probably, although you should talk about it, but I, I don't think that this is something that people would do um, anymore. So they're coming from cervical cancer, and they were obtained in 1951. All of those pictures are different things that people have done with them. They are just nice pictures of cells. So the little blue is the nuclei. This is where you have all your DNA, um, genetic information. And then these are just nice things that we do because we want to understand how cells function. So every cell has all kinds of stuff in there. Um, so here you stain for filaments that make the structure of the cell. Here you can stain for little dots so that these are connections between the cells. This is what we call the phase contrast. So this is going to be um, the microscope view of the cells. And really, the reason why those cells have been so popular, besides the fact you can grow them very easily, is because Dr. Gary distribute them for free. So they figure out a way to, to ship cells, which is not trivial either, because cells are live things. So they may not like to be shipped in a plane. They may not like to be at four degrees. They may not like to do all kinds of things. I was not sure my cells, I mean, I took them out of the incubator because we grow them at body temperature. So we have little armoire that are 37 degrees uh, because we need to maintain them at body temperature. Um, and the CO2 needs to be regulated and the humidity is regulated. Um, so some of them would just die, but these were tough. So they survived the shipment. So this is one of the reasons why they've been so widely used is because they were shipped for free and they were just surviving it. Um, and, but their genome is altered. So 
if we have 40 um, sex chromosomes and these have 80 something, um, so they are completely, <coughs> their nuclei, the content of their nuclei is completely abnormal, but it's a great tool. So what can we use cells for? Um, so one of them uh, that I chose is the production of vaccine. And again, it's in the context of, because the HeLa cells were used um, for uh, vaccine production. And one of the things you guys need to know is that, so we, we, we've developed vaccines so that we would not get sick. And we, one of the, you know, the vaccines are designed to um, diminish the effect of viruses. And viruses, so bacteria, you put a bacteria in a dish, it'll grow. It doesn't need anybody. You put a virus in a dish, it doesn't grow. It'll die. So the virus needs a cell in order to <coughs> reproduce. And this was essential um, in the uh, production of the vaccines is that if you, can, if you can take the virus and you can put it in a cell, then you'll maintain the virus. And then you can actually try to understand um, the infection rates and how the viruses act. But maybe that you can also understand how you can diminish its activity. And if you diminish its activity, but you can still, if you can put a, an attenuated form of the virus into people's body, and if the body is reacting, and doing what it's supposed to do, which is reacting to the virus and doing all of the good stuff about antibody and antigen and all of that, well, maybe the body will generate what it needs to do to protect itself, but the virus is attenuated. So the virus is actually not going to multiply and divide, but it will generate, it's, it's potent enough to generate the defense of your own body. So. HeLa cells were essential um, in, in the development of the vaccines because up until now, it was done in animal tissues. But for the polio virus, they decided, or the polio vaccine, they needed a huge amount of cells to test it. And what they found out is that the polio virus was infecting HeLa cells very efficiently. So they could use this to do all the safety tests that they needed to develop the vaccine. And this is really what they create, they uh, build a whole building for mass production of these HeLa cells so that they can actually develop uh, safety tests for the polio vaccine. Um, so in 1960, they developed the rubella vaccine, uh, but using this other cell line. And there are still today vaccines that are uh, produced in human cell lines, and I just listed a few of those. So cells uh, are very important for the production of vaccines, uh, <coughs> even as of today. So I'll give you now two examples of clinical <coughs> use of cells. And one uh, relates to cancer, and the other one will relate to skin. So, you may have heard um, people saying, you know, around you or uh, living here that, well, you have cancer, you're going to get chemotherapy, and then they're going to do a bone marrow transplant or they're going to do a stem cell transplant. And um, it's because of the progress of tissue culture that we can actually do this, and this is done uh, fairly regularly with very uh, good success. And so what do we do or what do people do? Um, so what they do is they collect uh, cells, whether from the bone marrow or from the blood of the patient who has the cancer. And it was originally developed for cancers that were more um, originating in the blood or in the bone marrow. And when they do that, it's, it's a heterogeneous population. So in the blood, you have tons of cells. In the bone marrow, you have tons of cells. Again, here, the bone marrow or the blood is, is the organ and then we have the tissue, and then we have all our little cells. And within those cells, there are some that are these stem cells. So these are the ones that keep proliferating and keep dividing and keep your tissue and your organ maintained for the rest of your life. So you can collect the bone marrow or the blood, and then you can isolate these cells. 
and by different ways, and I'm happy to talk to you about it, but I don't want to do it now. Um, and then you can freeze them. So I didn't actually talk about this, but you can freeze down cells. So if you have plenty of cells in that dish and you don't want to deal with them today, but you think that you have a really critical thing to do in a few days or in a week or in two weeks, you can actually put them in the bottom of a tube and you give them a specific food um, and then you slowly put them in a minus 20 and minus 80 and then you put it in liquid nitrogen which is even colder. You can keep cells for years. So Dr. Hayflick, who's now 85, so in 62 when he extracted those cells, he made 800 plus little tubes of his little cells. And he kept them in liquid nitrogen. And it's only, in, what, in 2007, so what, five, seven years ago, that he actually gave his last 10 little vials to a company for, him to, for them to take care of because he was sick and tired to run to wherever he had to go to get liquid nitrogen to keep his little 10 ampoules, okay? So you can keep them forever. So you can do this, so you can keep those stem cells um, into liquid nitrogen. And, and then your, the patient is going to go chemotherapy. So usually chemotherapy is going to wipe out all of your blood cells or all of your bone marrow cells. So what you do is you get rid of the good cells and the bad cells. So the good thing is you get rid of the bad cells. The bad thing is you get rid of the good cells. But you, t you took them out. You kept them. You froze them. So now what you can do is you can take them out, you can thaw them, and you can re-inject them to the patient. And what these cells are going to do is because they have the property off, they are going to re recreate your bone marrow. They are going to repopulate all of what the, your bone marrow had before you get chemotherapy. So this is a real example of how cells can be used in the clinic or as a treatment. Now this doesn't involve tissue culture. And so I say tissue culture, cell culture, just because as you saw at the beginning, it was people were using tissue into the things and not cells, but really. So this is just using cells as a way uh, of treating people. The other one that I want to talk about is keratinocyte culture for burn patients. So couple of terminology. So keratinocytes, this is a fancy word for saying the skin, the cells of your epidermis, okay? So these are the ones that you lose when you're getting, you know, you peel off um, your, the outside of the skin or if the skin is dry and you see all of these things that kind of fluff off. So these are keratinocytes. So the skin, as I say, so you have, this is a cartoon, so you have the epidermis on the top. This is what you see. And this is what you don't see, but you feel it. So this is your dermis. So this is kind of your little sponge. And it has all kinds of little things in there. It has elastin and collagen. And, and when we get older and we get wrinkles, it's because we have, you know, we're losing some of the elastin that kind of make us nice and, you know. Um, then you have blood vessels. And then you have the hairs that are coming out. So this is just a section, a histological section through, you know, this big square here. And so the epidermis is this stuff over on the top here that you just see in the corner. This would be a hair follicle, but because the section is not done exactly straight, it doesn't kind of come out yet. So if you burn yourself, you put your finger on the stove and you say, ouch, then what it does, that's a first degree burn. You just damage the cells of the epidermis, and that's about it. I'll do a blister. You have plenty of keratinocytes, they'll just divide, they'll heal, you're good. Well, you can burn yourself a little bit more and you can put it right under the epidermis so you kind of, it's gonna be a spot where your keratinocytes are gone and well, how are you gonna heal that? Or you can put it even deeper where there is really a bunch of chunk of dermis that gets burned and, and damaged. And eventually, you have a third degree burn where you really have, you have no s skin left, pretty much. And unfortunately, it happens more than we think. And how, how are we gonna treat these individuals? And so if this happened on a very small area, 
usually you have other sites that you can use. But if it happens on a big surface, then, then how, how are you going to you know, make these individuals survive? Because one of the main functions of the skin is really a barrier function. So it keeps you from losing water. It keeps, from wa it keeps water from coming in. Okay? When it rains, you're not blowing like a balloon. Okay? So, so this is what the, the skin of the epidermis looks like. And so all of these little units here, so I'm going to start here, this, 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 all of these are single cells, okay, all of those. So this is the epidermis, all of that, and this is just cells. It's just one cell next to each other. That's the only thing it is, okay? So if you look at this, I mean, if you would take a, a magnifier, you would actually see the top here. This is what you're looking at. You're looking down. And then down here is what we call the dermis, and so these are cells, but you see you have this pink stuff, and this is not cells. This is collagen and elastin and all of that. So what people thought was, well, if we can get an epidermis again, maybe we can help those patients. And can we do this by tissue culture? And yes, we can. So this is, again, coming back to that famous the cartoon of the principle, is that you take your biopsy, and then you cut it in small pieces, and you can separate your tissues. So you can separate your epidermis on one side and your dermis on the other. And then you can dissociate the epidermis. I show you, it's just cells. They're all connected to each other. Well, you can separate them. So you can just have individual cells into then a flask or a flask, then that you can grow them. And this is what they look like. Now, fibroblasts and keratinocytes, they look different just because they are coming from two different tissues. So fibroblasts are these long, elongated cells, and then keratinocytes are these nice, round, little cells. I lost the screen here, so I'm going to go over here. But you guys won't be able to hear me. The screen is black, so I don't see anything anymore. Um, so you can grow cells at the keratinocytes in a flask like this. And when the flask is full, you can actually detach the bottom. But instead of detaching the cells individually, the only thing you do is you just detach between the plastic and the sheet of the cells. So what you end up in your hand is actually a sheet of epidermal cells. So what we do, what we can do is we can actually put a gauze on it, it's just easier because you imagine it's worse than saran wrap or it would be maybe like toilet paper that's wet that you can barely manipulate, but the cells are there. So you put a gauze on it and then you, you have like staples around it. But what you're looking at, what's facing towards you is a sheet of epi epidermal cells, a sheet of keratinocytes grown from an individual. And I could do this with, if I would take a small little biopsy, we can probably get from something that is big like this, in three or four weeks, we could get enough of those to cover probably your entire arm. <coughs> so this was possible really because of progress is made in tissue culture. And this is a technique that is used it's used in different places, so it's used in different, uh, Iowa doesn't use that technique, but there's places in Boston, on the West Coast, in Canada, in Europe, that use that really to help patients that don't have much skin left from burn to be able to survive. Now, with that technique, the only thing we've done is we've reconstituted the epidermis, okay? So if I would do this on someone's skin, it will still look wrinkled. It's not perfect. Well, we didn't do anything with the other compartment, which is the dermis. So just a couple of um, slides on what people have thought about doing is that, well, we can probably take this little sponge or matrix and recreate that in the lab, and we can maybe put the cells that are coming from the dermis, so the fibroblast and maybe recreate a dermis. So back in uh, 1983, Dr. Bell was able to show that if you take collagen and you put the cells in them, 
you are able to, it's kind of like a jello. That's really what it looks like. But you put cells in them, and they are real cells, and they are cells from individuals, with the thought that maybe one day we could actually improve what we, they already knew how to do, which was to grow keratinocytes and help burn patients with um, the epidermis. But could they make it better? And could they make it look better? And maybe you can combine both of them. So we actually can, those days, take the cells from the dermis or from one of the compartments, the fibroblasts, and mix them or don't mix them because we've now figured out a way that we can make them produce all of this fluffy or jello thing uh, by themselves if we get, give them the right food. And so we can take these cells and then we can take our keratinocytes on the other side and we combine them. And what we do is we recreate a skin in the lab. So you're gonna say, well, fine you are passionate about skin and you just want to study it and you, you know, this is a great tool and we don't care. And you're probably right. Except that the FDA has actually approved, so this is considered as a drug. It's approved by the FDA. And this is just cells, cell material. This is not a chemical, this is not Tylenol, this is not a beta blocker. So this is for patients who have wounds that have wounds that usually don't heal very well, that people don't really know how, what's the next step, what's the next treatment. Well, so people, these tissue engineering, engineering guys and bioengineering and tissue culture people like us say, well, we wanna take this to the next level. And yeah, we didn't really, you know, you guys didn't care that I do the skin equivalent like I call it. But maybe if you have a wound, you would care that someone developed a product that maybe could you know, be useful for treating wounds that normally wouldn't heal. So what this is, is actually something that is on the market. And what it is, is that it's keratinocytes, so epidermal cells. And the donor is actually foreskin keratinocytes. So tissue that are um, circumcision, and we can talk about it, but you know, this is tissue that goes in the garbage. Well, there's no consent, but the garbage tissue is actually used. People extract keratinocytes and they'll extract the fibroblast. And they'll make this product that can actually, that is sold and that can be put on someone's leg. So this is actually not your cells. So the example of the burn patient, it would be your cells. I would have to take the cells of each burn patient. This is not, this is coming from a donor or from multiple donors, but it's, it's done. So I think what we've done is we've gone from using cells for producing things in companies to using cells for, for scientists to understand the different blocks of the body, understand how, how it functions, but also to use cells to actually um, understand our organ better but also to treat patients. So I'll just give you, just for the flavor of it, is that it doesn't stop at skin. And there's just other organs that now people are trying to recreate, but again, it's just cells. There's nothing else. So this is an example of blood vessels where the only thing that there is is just cells that are con normally constituting your blood vessels. So these fibroblasts, and they have fancy words for it. Um, but smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells, and so just by combining them, they're able to actually recreate pieces of blood vessels that, they can, that they've actually transplanted back into patients efficiently. So with this, um, I just wanted to finish by saying that I haven't talked anything about ethics. I haven't talked anything about you know, consent. I haven't. Um, we do deal with these issues. Um, I think um, as, a, as a tissue culture person, if, if something goes in the trash and I can use it and, and, and do science with it, um, we're always for it. Um, and we're like, well, if it goes in the trash and I just you know, use it like this and I never put a name on it, why do I need to, have an, why do I need to ask the person before they go in the OR if I can use that tissue, it's gonna go in the trash and I'm just gonna pick it up, I'll put it in a tube, I'll just put number one and that's it. 
And I would say that up until recently, I would still think that that should be, that is fine. I'm not gonna use, I'm not gonna go back trying to figure out who that person was. I'm not gonna try to, I'm just gonna need those cells for understanding how proliferation function works and how uh, the cells divide. But I'm gonna throw it out there that maybe I should think about it. And the reason is just because techmation that is in these cells. Someone, maybe not now, but maybe in 10 years, I don't think that those years are gonna be that many, will be able to say, oh, well, this is the DNA and the genetic information. Well, I know who that person is. I can find out who that person is. So back 50, 60 years ago, this was just not in the thoughts. And I would say 30 years ago, it wasn't in the thought either. But with the progress that we're making with the technology, I'm not sure that we can keep thinking that garbage is garbage, at least for using human material. So with that, um, I would encourage you guys to, I'll turn the microscope on and just, you know, if you can't look at it, just ask. You know, sometimes everybody has their eyes separated at different width, so you just have to push it or extend it, but just look at it if you are interested. So thank you. Thank you. Normally we don't have two speakers who do such a wonderful job and and would you be willing to answer some questions? Sure. So because we're live on channel 10, we would like to have you use the microphone so that the people at home can hear this. So if you have a question, if you could come up and ask and I think we'll ask answer questions maybe tell a quarter tell so that people can then look at the, the cells. Is that all right? Hi, I have a question. I'm trying to figure out how there is a difference between using the foreskin and that's okay, but you've realized in hindsight that it wasn't okay to use Henry Lack's cells without her permission. You know, I think that's still not, I, I think that's still a question that uh, you would not get the same answer on from every bioethicist or scientist. I mean, I think what, what we're talking about here is discarded tissue and um, what should be the rules about the use of tissues that come, that originate from people but normally in the course of everyday laboratory practice would be discarded like a foreskin or, um, and, and some of it may have to do with what, how much information is also used about the person. And I have to say, I don't know that very much information was used from Henrietta Lack's case in most of what was done with her cells after that point. Um, I don't even recall the details of how this got connected back to her actual identity later on, um, which is covered in Rebecca Sklut's book, I think, quite well. Well, I think that um, I could answer either way. I could say it should never be okay for using someone's tissue without their consent. I, I would say I can, I can answer either way. I could say, um, no, it's not okay. I think that you, you know, someone could say, well, this is a piece of tissue that's coming from an individual that the individual has the right to consent or not consent for giving it for research purposes. Um, on the other, I would, and I would say, as I said, up until now, I would have said, um, if there is no way, and I really mean no way, to go back to the identity of the donor, then then that's what we consider de-identified. So for a lot of studies, you can't just with one piece of tissue do what you want. So maybe you need like four or five from different individuals and you mix them all together. So all of these things would, would let us to think that we as scientists, we cannot do what we want. So I cannot just you know, go somewhere and just go at the outside of the OR and say, oh, do you have discarded tissue? Hey, I'll take it. No, I can't do this. So don't think that we can do that. I have to talk to this guy. <laughs> I have to write a fully 
you know, descriptive protocol by saying this is the study and this is why I want to do it and this is why I feel I don't need the consent of the individual. Now these people are going to say what you're doing is okay, so I'm not violating any issues here because I tell them I'm going to pull samples from five different people and I'm never going to know who these individuals are, ever. I'm going to put them in, you know, in a tube and it's going to have a code and we'll never be able to go back to the individual. Now, whether this is right or not, as I say, as of recently, I would have thought, I think this is, this is fine because there is no way to go back. But the no way to go back is only, I can only say this based on the current technology. And as of today, I would still say there is no way. But I can see that in 10 years, that no way will not be no way anymore. So the, it, the, it is very possible that by, you know, people are gonna, there's gonna be all of these genomes, so all the little letters that are on the DNA that are gonna be published, and it will be, I think, ways to go back to eventually these fingerprints are going to be out there, but then they're going to be unique fingerprints for each of us. And going back to a particular person, I'm not sure we can never, we will not be able to say we can never go back to that. So the, the idea that um, why was it, you know, why is it such a big issue with the healer cells? I think what added to this is that a very, um, unfortunate and very um, non-professional non act by a scientist who actually ended up putting the name of the person in a paper. So the name of this lady was actually put in an article. I mean, and Rebecca Slew talks about it. Um, and then people actually saw the name of the individual. Again, this is something that as today, nobody in the science world would actually put the name of a donor. And I would, if I work with um, patients who have psoriasis or patients who have cleft palate, I may, I'm going to use a code. I will never go back and put a name. I mean, I know it's, it almost seems crazy to think about that they could have done this. But, but I think really this is how this is why now the family kind of have, or the name of the individual has been put forth. I mean, the WI38, you don't know who that person is. We don't know. I mean. Actually, it's interesting that for a long time, in fact, when I was in medical school and we were told about this cell line, we were told that the name of the woman uh, from whom the tumor was taken was actually Helen Lane. And then that was the origin of the Gila, you know, uh, label. But for some reason, that didn't persist, and they were re-identified it as coming from Henrietta Lacks. And I've forgotten exactly yeah, that remember. story, that part of the story. Although it is covered in the book. I'm just um, thinking about if I were to have surgery, and I'm going to sign a consent form that says, "Okay, you can take off my little finger." and then you're going to discard it once it's removed, that doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want to with this before you discard it. It's, you know, it's a consent to have a procedure done, and then the tissue will be discarded. That doesn't mean, you know, whether it's my finger or a cell or an entire body or a cadaver or something, you know, there needs, I would assume there needs to be consent for whatever's going to happen with what was mine. If you read the standard uh, operative consent form that's used at the University of Iowa uh, for any kind of surgical procedure, it actually says that you know tissue that is not used in your diagnosis and is going to be discarded may be used for research. Now, uh, does that automatically, in our view as IRB people, does that automatically authorize any and all things that you might want to do with it? I, I would say probably not, but it, it, these, the form does, does actually say that as a default uh, possibility. It doesn't say it will just be discarded and nothing else done with it. Okay, hello. So we're reading Gila in our class, and we came a bit over a big controversy about 
how it has done so much and how it is unfair that she didn't get compensated or that her family has good enough health care. I just kind of wondered what you guys thought on the topic. If you have read the book, hopefully. Yeah, yeah I, I have. That's a, that's a separate issue that is certainly relevant and is, is so thorny that I, I hardly know what to, to say about it. On, on the one hand, that only seems fair that when products that are derived from people's cells or tissues are commercialized, that maybe they should have some benefit that comes from that. On the other hand, if that were to become routine, I, I'd suspect that a lot of beneficial things would just become financially uh, impossible. Um, nowadays, we try hard in those situations where, I mean, we try very hard in those situations where we get consent from people um, for the use of their tissues in research, we routinely insert language that says, you know, this might be used to make a commercial product. If that happens, we don't have any plans to compensate you. And if they find that unacceptable, then they don't have to do the research. All right, um, aside from actually receiving the patient's consent, wouldn't it be in your favor for you to know who this uh, who these cells came from, just in case there's some, something special about these cells so later on you can say, oh, I want to go back and find out more about this person. Just like in the book, um, later on, it was many years after her death, they said, we want to find out more about her family to see if there's something special about their cells. So wouldn't it be more, I'm just curious as to why, why you would just label it as a number and not actually find out who these cells came from. So if there is something special about them, you can always go back to them or go back to their families and you know, do more research and stuff. So I think that kind of comes into play as a scientist in, in I would say, scientific planning or intention. And I think that um, we have to, um, so usually, most of the time, if we do our job well, we should have a hypothesis. And so we should say, we are interested in collecting cells or collecting tissue from this group of individuals because we are interested in studying this and this and this. So I think from the beginning, we as scientists need to decide whether we have an intention to go back to be able to find out what these people had. So if we think that we want to study the cells but want to be able to go back to medical history and find out whether these individuals had cancer or these individuals had gray hair or these individuals had whatever we're interested in, then I think that up front, we need to be up front with ourselves and say we're going to need consent. If we do not get consent, then if we did the, our study right, then there is no way for us to go back to the individual. So we didn't consent them, then we'll never know. So this is why I say the never know, I don't know anymore, but, but I would say that it's really up to us. If we, if we collect you know, foreskin samples and we really think that the only thing we want to do is get keratinocytes because that's what we need, it's just cell, just material to do our study, then we make that decision up front and there is no way to be able to go back because we won't have collected any information. If we think that we're interested in knowing what are the letters in the genome, and if someone has you know, different letters because we think that it may have an effect on cells closing a wound, then we need up front to consent people and say, and tell them, you know, we are interested in collecting your tissue because we are interested in looking at wound healing and cell migration, and, and I think that's just a proper way of acting as scientists. Well, please join me in thanking Professor Donwald and Dr. Bartolatas for this wonderful evening. And she is willing to stay a little bit longer and let people look in the microscope because obviously you love what you do both of you, and I appreciate you coming. And I do encourage you to attend if you are interested, and you obviously are, on Thursday night, October 10th, the evening with the Lax family. And do come early to that, because it is in the Dean Ballroom on the lower level of the Sheraton, and there are only 475 seats. And since there were 91 of you here tonight, you're obviously interested. So thank you again for coming. <laughs>